Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us today. We're really excited. This is a session we've been talking about for a while, wanting to do because um, there seems to be a fairly high rate of infantile spasms in our community, and um, I think both diagnosed and undiagnosed. Uh, and today we're going to talk a little bit more about what infantile spasms are. They're a early onset, very difficult to control type of seizure. Um, and we're very interested in studying this more, learning more about families who have um, this form of seizure early on, if the treatments that are uh, recommended work, uh, and if other seizure starts type uh, types start, um, and kind of what outcomes are for families who start with infantile spasms. Um, and we're really lucky today that we've got Madeline Uden with us, who you all probably know is mom to Margo. Um, who she'll take you on the journey with them through infantile spasms. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Gabby Conacher. I am one of the co-founders of the International SCNA Day Alliance with Michael Hammer, who's here with us, and Jayetta Hecker, who's on the call as well, uh, who's my mother. Um, so we've been doing this since uh, as a foundation since 2014. Um, working in SCNA Day. And um, this has always been something that I've wanted to learn more about because my son Elliot had uh, spasms and they were very, very challenging uh, and went unrecognized for a long time. And I think we're hopefully going to hear from you all after we do a few presentations today to share a little bit more about infantile spasms, demystify them a little bit, talk about some of what we really know um, we want to hear from you. So uh, our goal is to share some information and then really learn and um, and find ways to document what's really happening with families with SCNA Day and infantile spasms. So um, once we get to the discussion portion, I'm going to ask people to either raise their their hands or put their name in the chat and what um, uh, and say what language you're going to speak in the chat because we have to change it. Um, in the back end to say what language is being spoken so it can be translated correctly. So um, I think when you want to say something, please put, uh, you know, just write something in the chat and, and what name, what language you want to speak. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Michael and Madeline to, to dig in here. I think Michael's going to start with a little bit about what we know about SCNA Day um, and infantile spasms. And then Madeline's going to um, take us through and, and talk a little bit more about the treatment protocols and, um, you know, kind of what some of the other literature and, and research is. So uh, feel free to use the chat as we're going if you have thoughts or ideas or anything. Um, and we're glad to have you here. Well, hello, everyone. It's great to see you all. And thank you very much for the four of you that filled out the survey that we sent out on Thursday night. That was a very quick response and we'll keep the survey active. Um, I'm not sure if anybody wants to go start doing it now, probably not, they'll probably wanna listen, but um, it only takes probably about 10, 15 minutes to do and, it, and I'm gonna show you the results that we have so far. Um, I thought we just start with this video um, and then maybe uh, before I talk about the registry data, maybe Madeline, we go next and then I'll come back and do the registry data because it'll just be more of a natural flow. But this is probably the first best thing to start. So everyone might recognize uh, this. It's nothing, I'm gonna read it so it translates. These are infantile spasms, a dangerous type of seizure. Where the arms and legs flail up in clusters or the head nods repeatedly. Infantile spasms are an emergency that are often overlooked or misdiagnosed as colic, reflux, or exaggerated startle reflex, 
If you suspect your baby is having infantile spasms, stop. See the signs, clusters of sudden repeated uncontrolled movements like head bobs, or I think that take a video, record symptoms and talk to your doctor immediately. Obtain diagnosis, confirm an irregular brain wave pattern with an EEG test and prioritize treatment and spasms to minimize developmental delays. Every day you delay, you increase your child's risk of brain damage. For more information, go to www.infantilespasms.org. Stop infantile spasms. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you one slide and then we're gonna to go to Madeline. So this is just showing you uh, 205 individuals that do not report infantile spasms. And this is 63 individuals in our database that have reported infantile spasms. And what the bar chart is showing is the age at which seizures started, not necessarily infantile spasms. I'm gonna show you that later, if infantile spasms are always the first seizure type or if they evolve secondarily. So 20, almost 24% of the individuals with gain of function variants in our database report infantile spasms, either as a first seizure type or as developing later. And then just shows you that the age at onset in the first month of life, the second month, the third month, the fourth month. So typically we have a bimodal distribution where we have nearly 20% of people getting their first seizure in the first month of life, which is called the neonatal period. And then a mode, another peak around five months. And then a tail, and there are some individuals that get seizures starting even over 10 months. What's interesting is that we also have the same bimodal peak with the infantile spasms even more dramatically. So 22% of the 63 reported their first seizure in the neonatal period. And then we get a peak that is a little bit earlier than the peak for the non, but around four months. So we have two populations, the neonatal infantile spasm and then the four month or five month infantile spasm. And I'm gonna break that down and show you some of the similarities and differences among those that are in these different groups. But I think for now, I'd like to go to Madeline, who has yeah. who's a, um, a researcher and mom and uh, has a daughter with infantile spasms. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really um, happy that we are. I'm sorry, my voice is not great. I just had a little cold, so I'm still recovering and sound a little raspy. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm you know um, happy that we are talking about this with our kids because this was really a major seizure type Margot had at the beginning, and um, you know I think there's a lot that we can learn from from each other and you know how our kids um, deal with infantile spasms. So. Don't want to get too technical, but um, a, a, a spasm is a type of seizure and it's often called West syndrome. So that's kind of the general name for infantile spasms. So if you hear that, that's what it is. But West syndrome is just relates to these types of seizures. It's not really to a specific cause or a specific gene. It's, it's kind of any type of um, spasms. And so again, these mostly appear in the first year of life. And so Overall, it's usually between ages four and eight months. And so as you saw in the video, there's these subtle movements um, with this jackknife movement, but also these like head drops. Um, and they usually occur in clusters. So there'll be, you know, several one after another up to, I know Margot had like 25 in a cluster or so. And often they happen when the children are waking up from sleep. Um, and so not only is there like a visual, you know, seizure, you can see these, these clusters of repetitive movements, but there's that they can see on an EEG. But the other thing that makes infantile spasms um, so, uh, you know, negative for, for development is this background brain wave, brain wave pattern called hypsarrhythmia. 
And this is just a picture, you know, a healthy EEG where we have, you know, the background resting, you know, these nice little waves and then this hips arrhythmia is just, you know, super chaotic. And so basically it's just this white noise background in the brain um, that's happening even when there aren't seizures. So just constantly. And that makes it really hard for kids that have spasms to be able to learn anything, to have their brain develop and, and function well. So there's kind of two parts, the, the spasm seizure part, and then the, the hip arrhythmia that's only visible on the EEG. And so, you know, often um, this is, you know, misdiagnosed as colic or reflux or starter reflex. Um, and, you know, that can be really frustrating. Um, there are like two infantile spasm Facebook groups where, you know, people will come in and post a video with their kid and be like, do you think this is something, you know, spasm and, and parents will comment and, you know, not that like we are experts, but sometimes there are patterns that look similar. And generally the recommendation is to go to um, an ER of like a pediatric hospital where they would know more what infantile spasms are because lots of hospitals don't know, especially if they don't deal with like pediatric, um, you know, epilepsy. So that's usually the recommendation is, is, you know, if, if you think that your child is having spasms to, um, go make, you know, drive, you know, further, if you have to, to go to a, a pediatric children's hospital ER, um, and ask for an EEG. And so there are multiple causes for these. So, um, they can be caused by um, this tuberosclerosis complex or TSC, um, uh, which is a separate disease, you know, that can cause some brain tumors as well, it can be caused by brain structural issues, something that can be seen by an MRI, something usually called focal cortical dysplasia or FCD, it can be caused by a genetic disorder like SDNA day, or it can be caused, you know, as a result of some kind of birth, hypoxic birth injury. So, this is a seizure type that, you know, lots of different things can cause it, but it's a really unique seizure type in that it's treated for the seizure type that it is, no matter kind of what the cause is. You treat the spasms, not the underlying cause. Um, and so that's a bit unique than other seizures where, um, you know, like we know for SDNA day, there are certain drugs that, you know, we want to take for that as opposed to others, but for spasms, there's kind of a core protocol of drug treatment, and it doesn't really matter which gene is mutated that might cause the epilepsy. Um, so then I just, the main treatments for spasms are um, this high-dose steroids. Um, and so this is to kind of, um, reduce inflammation in the brain. Um, and so there's two um, treatment approaches, prednisolone, which is a liquid steroid, which is taken by mouth. Um, and then um, ACTH, which is a synthetic uh, hormone that is made and that's injected um, with a needle intramuscularly in the leg. Um, and so both of these are a fixed time course, one month time course. And um, and you see if it works or not. Um, and then uh, another option that is done after or at now sometimes at the same time is this drug called Vigabitrin or Sabril. And this you can stay on for a long time. Um, this does come with some high risks. This is, this is the drug that is one of the scariest where you have to you know, sign some very clear forms um, you know, saying that you know the risks. Um, I have to say that from what I've heard, and I'm not a clinician, this is just from my experience as a parent and talking to other parents, um, for a long time, there was a lot of warnings about um, vision damage for vigabitrin, that this was a high risk for inducing damage to your eyes, and you need to do um, visual uh, eye tests every few months while you're on it. But it seems that now that there's an understanding that this only happens after many, many years on the treatment, not just the short times that usually our kids are on it. And so it's not as um, scary that the risk is not as high um, and they don't need to do as many tests on your eyes while you're on this. So I just, you know, it's still a scary drug, all these drugs, but um, I know this has changed. So those are usually the first courses, um, but, you know, if these don't work, um, there are other options. The main two um, are Clobazam or Onfi, 
and then the ketogenic diet. But there are lots of other drugs too that can be tried. Um, and so again, for spasms, you really treat you know this type of seizure with these treatments. You know, it doesn't matter if it's caused by SCNA day, you treat the spasms. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple things um, in terms of studies. Um, there's, you know, a lot of discussion about which steroid is best, whether the intramuscular injection, which is actually a really costly treatment, um, is very expensive and um, sometimes can be hard to get approved by insurance. And so people have compared to see if one works better than the other, the liquid steroid prednisolone, which is very cheap, and the ACTH, which is very expensive. Um, and over lots of patients, there's no difference between the two. Um, obviously, some can work better for certain patients, but overall, um, there's no difference. So, um, you know, it's definitely worth going with prednisolone as, you know, the cheaper, more accessible option than, than ACTH. Um, as Michael mentioned, in order to, you know, um, assess whether treatment is working, um, you have to have both an EEG and usually a couple hours, about 150 minutes is like what's recommended um, to really be able to see if, you know, the treatment worked. So you need to check by EEG to make sure the treatment worked and see if that background brave Wayne pa pattern I talked about, hip arrhythmia is gone, the seizures are gone, but also, you know, a visual assessment from the caregivers to see if these are, are gone. So you do want to check by EEG to make sure. And then this is a newer study that, um, you know, as, as Gabi mentioned, what was mentioned in the, in the video, you know, this is really something you want to treat really aggressively. And so, um, you know, if after a week of a new therapy, they don't, the children don't respond, then, you know, right away, you need to move on to the next treatment. Um, and this is, you know, a newer study from 2022, but it's important to really, you know, be on top of this. And if, if after a week of trying something, the spasms are still there, email your neurologist to be like, we need, you know, uh, to try something new. Um, so lastly, I'll just, um, you know, share kind of Margot's journey with infantile spasms, because um, we tried lots of different things. Um, and this is kind of what really got me, you know, really interested in learning more about other uh, patients with SCNA day and what their spasm journey was and what drugs worked for them. So this is Margot now, she's two, just over two years old and has uh, two mutations in, in the SCNA day uh, gene. Um, and so I'm, I'm a scientist, so I graph my data um, and um, just to you know, be able to see the seizures. So on, red here on this graph is the number of spasms she was having every day. So you know, some days up to almost 200 spasms. Um, and in blue are other seizure types that she's developed along the way. And so, um, you know, Margo, her first seizure was not a spasm. She had these short focal seizures, just some um, eye and mouth twitches, and she uh, took Keppra and Keppra worked for her. And then it, it was fine, but they sent out for genetic sequencing and we found out she had this mutation in SCNA day. And so I learned about spasms and then she started having them. So she started having spasms at five months, which is kind of that second cohort that Michael mentioned. Um, she had this hip arrhythmia, this brain background. And so we started prednisolone, the oral steroid, uh, but that didn't work at all. There was you know, no, no change at all. Um, but at the time they made, me, made us do that two week full treatment before they started anything new. So in hindsight, I wish could have started something more aggressively, but because it really didn't do a thing. So then we started this bigabitrin, this Sabral drug that, you know, you have to sign these very serious forms about the potential risks. Um, and thankfully they stopped right away. So that was really great. Um, and the, the hips arrhythmia went away as well, the background wave, and that has never come back. So that has always stayed away. But then, you know, the spasms came back. Um, first she had this apneic seizure, just a short seizure where she stopped breathing. So she started this drug Depakote, which apparently is used in some countries to treat spasms too. So we thought that was something worth trying. Um, but then her spasms came back, not as badly, but they did. And so because um, we had tried prednisolone, our neurologist then recommended trying ACTH, the other one, because he said sometimes, you know, like they don't respond to one, but they respond to the other. So at 
seven months we started this ACTH treatment with these intramuscular injections. Um, and then they, they slowed down and stopped and went back down to zero for about a month or so. But then they came back again with a vengeance um, really badly. Um, and so by that point, we started um, on fee or clobazam, but then we also were able to get admitted to start the ketogenic diet. And so that's kind of the like, um, kind of mentioned the main treatment plan. And so with the ketogenic diet, um, you know, you have to be inpatient for a couple of days to start that. Um, and then you increase your fat intake compared to your um, carbohydrate intake. And you have to do it kind of slowly over, over a four or five week period. But, you know, as you can see, they really slowly, really went down with keto. And so that was really great. Um, so then they stopped, but then she started having other seizures. So she started having tonic seizures. Um, and so then, um, we started oxcarbazepine or trileptal. Then her spasms came back for one last time. Um, and there we just, um, increased her on fee or clobazam and, and cause we were still at a pretty low dose there. We hadn't maxed out and they stopped. And then she developed clonic seizures. Um, and so then we started another sodium channel blocker because Margot had a lot of, um, some issues with oxcarbazepine and low sodium and getting the drug high enough. And then we, she never had spasms again. So, I mean, you know, we had a, a really intense year and, and it's been, you know, almost a year since the end of this graph and she hasn't had spasms, but she still has these tonic and clonic seizures. So separate, not tonic clonics, she does not have those, but she has kind of these um, shorter seizures that cluster. So, um, you know, she's very delayed. Um, she has very low muscle tone, does not have head control or anything. She also has this cortical visual impairment where your eyes are fine, but your brain can't see, which is often associated with spasms. Um, so I think, you know, she's quite severe on the, on the spectrum in terms of development. Um, and she still has daily seizures. Again, these usually very short tonic and tonic seizures. So, um, you know, but, um, yeah, so, you know, we had a really rough time with spasms. They're really hard to treat and to get rid of, and we try lots of different things. Um, so, yeah, so that's been our journey, and I'm, you know, curious to learn more and see what else we can learn about our SCNA Day kids and spasms. Madeline, can I ask a question? Yeah. So it looks like um, this up and down journey, when you got the spasms controlled and then another seizure type evolved, and then you... Yeah that the spasms would always come back briefly and then you would try and treat them separately and it was like one thing would lead to the other and it was back and forth back and forth yeah and today you're still on um you're still on oxcarbazepine phenytoin and clobazam uh we're still on clobazam and phenytoin we we had to stop oxcarb because yeah her sodium issues were too complicated and um, you know, we had to really restrict her fluids to deal with that, which is not great for keto. And then she was having other issues. So, so she's on phenytoin, she's on clobazam, um, and she's on excopri. Okay. Um, how's, how's excopri? It's been great. It's been great. Um, she's gone from like a hundred tonics a day down to like five in the last like three or four months. So it's been really good for us. Awesome. Okay, thanks. So yeah. Other questions for Madeline? Because I, I can I can do the registry stuff just to show you what we're learning so far and why why we um one of the reasons why we started this uh discussion was that we realized that infantile spasms are difficult and dangerous, and we really wanted to understand more and specifically about how SCN8A and infantile spasms might be different or the same as other types of infantile spasms. And so we put together this survey, and I really hope everyone can do it. And um, we would like to write a paper, Madeline and I would like to be, as scientists, write a paper if we're really discovering something important and unique, we would try and publish that. 
but it would be based entirely on your input. As I'm going to show you now, the registry data are very interesting, but but not not complete, not not far enough along for we can really say much. So um, let me just go through these slides. I'll try and be brief and not too complicated. Um, they're all bar charts and things like that. So in the end, I'll show you a map of the gene and where we think the infantile spasm mutations cluster, which is also something we'd like to understand because they're not randomly spread throughout the gene. They seem to be clustering. So right now I've broken down those who report infantile spasms in the registry by whether infantile spasms were their first and only seizure type whether they were the first, but they were also in, had other seizure types at the same time, and whether there were infantile spasms that uh, appeared later after other seizure types. And uh, my own daughter was one of the late infantile spasms. They were no longer infantile because she was four, so they were just called epileptic spasms. Um, and you can see the number of individuals in the study, it adds up to about 63 individuals, and about 15 or 16 had infantile spasms as their only first sign. And then the majority had infantile spasms in conjunction with other seizure types. And then a smaller number had infantile spasms or epileptic spasms that developed later. And so we'd kind of like to know, are these different groups? Do they need to be treated differently? And uh, what's going on? So. 20, like I said, about a quarter of individuals had infantile spasms as the first seizure type. And only 14% of those reported being treated with the protocol that Madeline just went through. So treated with vigabatrin or and or steroids. And so that's a really small number. And that's the other thing we really need to understand. Why, why is it that um, our children weren't being treated with the standard infantile spasm protocol. And I know that that's probably partly because they were confused as other things, and maybe you would miss the window to treat them. Um, so now I'm going to do some comparisons between those that have infantile spasms and that those that do not have infantile spasms in the reg registry, just to get a sense of how serious this is. So interestingly, we normally see um, the later the age of onset of your seizure, the more mild your outcome, because development is disrupted the earlier your seizure. So there's a whole bunch of critical periods of development that get disrupted when your seizures start younger. And when they start older, you've already accomplished quite a bit. So you can build on what you've previously accomplished. And so it's unusual to see in our case, the mean age of seizure onset for infantile spasms is older than for non-infantile spasms. That's because infantile spasms tend to start later. But a critical outcome measure like seizure freedom is much lower in infantile spasms than it is for those that do not have infantile spasms. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an important indicator, obviously, that they're more serious, this type of seizure. If we look at development, we also see that those with infantile spasms report developmental delays, even though 80% of non-infantile spasms also report developmental delays, but almost 92% report developmental delays. And that's like probably an underreported number, but it's based on what parents say, yes or no, developmental delay. And then we have a developmental quotient that's way more complicated. It's based on all those Denver 2 skills, how how they're acquired, acquired at what age relative to neurotypical kids. And you can see that even the non-infantile spasm uh, kids, um, they only have a developmental quotient of around 40%, whereas it's lower for those with infantile spasms, about 25%. So it's a number between zero and one. And so all of us with SCNA Day are, have a lower developmental quotient because we, we acquire skills more slowly. Um, then we look at the number of seizure types. We also think this is an indicator of severity. 
So if you have a lot of different seizure types, it's you're diff more difficult to control and you have a, a, a more severe outcome generally. And also you can see infantile spasms have more seizure types as the first seizure, seizure start. And then they have more seizures even as they are included in the survey. So they're older, they've had seizures for a while and they have a higher number of current seizures in the registry. Then we have um, another assessment of severity. How many drugs, how many ASMs are you on? And so the number of current drugs is higher with infantile spasms. And you've also tried and failed more drugs. And that's partly because if you're on the protocol, well, you're going to try those drugs and you're going to wean them. So we count that as a wean. So, but in any case, not many have actually gone on the protocol. So it's still an indication of trying and failing drugs, more so with infantile spasms. Now I'm trying to break up the groups into the non-infantile in the black bar and the blue are the infantile spasms. And this is all very, very preliminary. But so here's those that had infantile spasms as the first seizure only. Here's those that had an infantile spasm plus other seizures as the first seizures. And here's those that developed them late. And here's the few people that went on the infantile spasm pro treatment protocol. And here's those that did not. So it's a bit complicated. There's a lot being shown. I'm just kind of throwing in some ideas here. So relative to the non-infantile spasm, which we'll consider our baseline, we have perhaps those that have an infantile spasm plus another seizure, obviously they have an increased number of seizure types at first. That's just baked into the definition. Then you see the number of current seizures. Well, are those that had an infantile spasm first actually doing slightly better than those that had uh, infantile spasms late or infantile spasms plus other? And did those that had the IS treatment protocol get any improvement? And there's a possible sign of that because those that have infantile spasm protocol seem to have fewer current seizure types now. But it's not, I haven't done any statistics on this. It's all just sort of seat of the pants science. <laughs> And we're gonna, we wanna do uh, real statistical testing on this, but we need to do more work to get there. Um, now let's look at the current and weaned anti-seizure drugs. You can see the number of current drugs doesn't really vary across these groups, although those on the protocol might be showing some reduction. Again, statistics, I don't know, probably not, but it's a hint. And the number of weaned drugs, well, if they're on the protocol, then they're automatically going to wean more just because they're going to go off the drugs they, they were on the protocol. Now let's look at development. So the age of onset is something that we don't change. That's just what start, that's just a way of characterizing your potential for outcome. Again, like I said, age of onset is a predictor of outcome. And those that had the infantile spasms only tend to be in that later group of onset time. Those that have the seizure, uh, first uh, infantile spasm uh, in combination with other seizure types tend to be in the earlier see, uh, class of onset. There shouldn't be any differences between those on the protocol and not. It's not, it just should be roughly even. There's just very few people that have done the protocol. And you can see here the developmental quotient. I don't know why it's so low on the, it's only maybe seven individuals. So that could just be an artifact. But you could see that perhaps um, those that have the infantile spasms as their first seizure type have a lower acquisition of developmental skills. And so these are only hints. We don't know for sure yet. All right, I'm going to switch a gear. Question. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, um, yeah. To clarify one thing. So when you're looking at the development, how old are the kids now, right? So are like, you know, on average, you know, are you looking at 10 year olds or three, like, you know, two year olds? I think I have a table here. I wasn't going to show this, but here you go. Here's the current ages in years for okay. all these groups. Oh, wow. And the age that they were included in the study here. So, 
Uh -huh. Look, most, I mean, again, these are averages. And we really have to take into account every individual. Like, how old are they now relative to the age at which infantile spasms started? Some of them are still infantile. <laughs> and right. so, and others are six or seven years old. So that gives us an opportunity to do retrospective studies at different time points looking in the past. What we'd like to do is do a prospective study. And that's something we're talking about doing in general for the registry is to try and get 50 or 60 families that we can follow for five years. So a long-term study, but, we, but it, prospective studies are much more powerful than retrospective. So if we can include a cohort of infantile spasms starting relatively young and moving forward as they get older, that would be awesome. That would really help teach us the natural history much better than the retrospective studies. All right, I'm just gonna finish up and show you the map of the NAV 1.6 channel. This is all 63 individuals, where their variants are and whether they're, um, whether they were the, um, the first seizure type or did they develop late. In the red, they developed late. In the black, they were one of the first seizure types, if not the only, but it's all combined. And so I've kind of done, a, you can see these things look, there's patterns. There's a whole bunch of arrows here, a whole bunch here. And then for some reason, we're seeing some clustering down at the inside of the cell. So this is outside of the cell, this is inside of the cell. And then there, I call this the hinge region between the transmembrane region and then these little loops that project into, into the intracellular region. So a simpler way of looking at this is Margot has a variant, as, as Madeline said, that's uh, 217. That is right in the middle of this super hot spot. This, this right here between segment three and four and this loop is a super hot spot. Um, we also, where Elliot has his variant right here at 850, there are a bunch of kids with 850 that have infantile spasms. That's a hot spot. And then the potential other spots that we're seeing tend to be in this hinge region between this, this sort of bottom of the segment towards the intracellular side of the channel and then the loops that go in into the channel, into the cell. And then there's another hot spot here. So there's some similarities between D2 and D4. You've got a hot spot in D and S4 in both of them. And you've got a hot spot in the, the linker between four and five in both of them. Um, and then there's similarities here as well, going into this loop. We've got a hot spot and both going into both loops. And the inactivation gate may also have something going on. So we're going to need to do more work because we have to vet whether these are truly infantile spasms. We don't have EEG records and hypsarrhythmia notes on everyone. We only have it on a few. But our current survey with 20-some questions asks about EEG, hypsarrhythmia. And it's our, just our first version of the survey. But if we can get 30 families to fill it out, we should have some really cool information. And I'm just gonna end with, I wanna make sure that everyone who did the survey so far gets some recognition, but it's only four people. But these are the things we asked, some of the things we asked. Was there any unusual signs before you noticed the first seizure? And actually three out of four people said yes. And those unusual signs could be some delay in development or something else. And I'm very curious as to what we notice before we notice the first seizure. And if that's a prediction of anything. Those that had about half were diagnosed with reflux or startle reflex, uh, two of four. Um, two of uh, half had the infantile spasm as the first seizure only. Um, hips arrhythmia on the EG. Uh, 50% said yes, and 50% did not have an EEG. So that's another thing we need to emphasize, how important that is. But those that did, did have hips arrhythmia. Um, currently, none of the four is seizure-free. Um, half outgrew the infantile spasms entirely, and one didn't answer, and one said no. So that could still be a very young person. And then... 
looking at the treatments, we don't have enough information, but this is the kind of thing we're going to learn. So prednisolone, nobody had tried it. Vigabatrin, two people out of four had. One had some success, one did not. Uh, ACTH, uh, one person tried it, and that was successful. Um, the valproate, you know, right now is winning, and three out of four tried it, and it did, did something beneficial. And I can ask, I'll go back to Madeline afterwards and ask about valproate. And then Clobazam, you can see one person tried it and it was successful. And the keto diet, we have yet to have anyone in the survey try the keto diet. So I think that's my last slide. And I, I think it's a good place to end. Well, I'll just say that other seizure types evolved after IS. And these are some of the types that tonic, myoclonic, atonic, absence typically evolves afterwards. Sometimes generalized tonic clonic. And in Margot's case, it was tonic and clonic. So we can add you guys into the survey when you do it. And then developmental skills. It was, I was very impressed with how many had gained some basic skills. In fact, somebody was walking, crawling was good, eating by mouth, uh, three out of four sitting in it. So this is excellent. This is better than I thought we'd see. But I, I think we need to clarify that to make sure that we're asking the right question. But I'll end here. And if there are any, Margo, I mean, Madeline, if you want to tell us how VPA or Valproate might be something that's tried or not tried typically. Um, but anyway, I'll stop there. Yeah, I don't have that much. I know some people, I know, I mean, I know one parent um, I've talked to from the group, their child, it worked for them. And I know it's used in some other countries for spasms. That's what our neurologist had said. So, um, so yeah, so that's why I thought it was still good to include in the survey. Cause I know it has, I know it has worked for, I mean, there, I have one family in mind, but I know maybe others. So um, yeah. Okay. Well, it seems uh, three out of four said something good about it. Yeah. So that's that's a start. <laughs> so anyway, um, I think it might be fun to go around, have everyone introduce themselves at the